This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Corrie Samuel. The Wood Beyond the World by William Morris. Chapter 11 Walter Happeneth on the Mistress. It was but a little afternoon when Walter left the maid behind. He steered south by the sun, as the maid had bidden him, and went swiftly, for, as a good knight wending to battle, the time seemed long to him till he should meet the foe. So an hour before sunset he saw something white and gay gleaming through the boles of the oak-trees, and presently there was clear before him a most goodly house, builded of white marble, carved all about with knots and imagery and the carven folk were all painted of their lively colours, whether it were their raiment or their flesh, and the housings wherein they stood all done with gold and fair hues. Gay were the windows of the house, and there was a pillared porch before the great door, with images betwixt the pillars, both of men and beasts, and when Walter looked up to the roof of the house he saw that it gleamed and shone, for all the tiles were of yellow metal, which he deemed to be of very gold. All this he saw as he went, and tarried not to gaze upon it, for he said, Belike there will be time for me to look on all this before I die. But he said also, that, though the house was not of the greatest, it was beyond compare of all the houses of the world. Now he entered it by the porch, and came into a hall many pillared and vaulted over, the walls painted with gold and ultramarine, the floor dark and spangled with many colours and the windows glazed with knots and pictures. Midmost thereof was a fountain of gold, whence the water ran two ways in gold-lined runnels, spanned twice with little bridges of silver. Long was that hall, and now not very light, so that Walter was come past the fountain before he saw any folk therein. Then he looked up toward the high seat, and him seemed that great light shone thence and dazzled his eyes, and he went on a little way, and then fell on his knees, for there before him on the high seat sat that wondrous lady, whose lively image had been shown to him thrice before, and she was clad in gold and jewels, as he had erst seen her. But now she was not alone, for by her side sat a young man, goodly enough, so far as Walter might see him, and most richly clad, with a jewelled sword by his side, and a chaplet of gems on his head. They held each other by the hand, and seemed to be in dear converse together, but they spake softly, so that Walter might not hear what they said, till at last the man spake aloud to the lady, Seest thou not that there is a man in the hall? Yea, she said, I see him yonder, kneeling on his knees. Let him come nigher, and give some account of himself. So Walter stood up and drew nigh, and stood there all shamefaced and confused, looking on those twain, and wondering at the beauty of the lady. As for the man, who was slim and black-haired and straight-featured, for all his goodliness Walter accounted him little, and no wise deemed him to look chieftain-like. Now the lady spake not to Walter any more than erst, but at last the man said, Why doest thou not kneel, as thou didst erewhile? Walter was on the point of giving him back a fierce answer, but the lady spake and said, Nay, friend, it matters not whether he kneel or stand, but he may say, if he will, what he would have of me, and wherefore he is come hither. Then spake Walter, for as wroth and ashamed as he was, Lady, I have strayed into this land, and have come to thine house as I suppose, and if I be not welcome, I may well depart straightway, and seek a way out of thy land, if thou wouldst drive me thence, as well as out of thine house. Thereat the lady turned and looked on him, and when her eyes met his, he felt a pang of fear, and desire mingled, shoot through his heart. This time she spoke to him, but coldly, without either wrath or any thought of him. Newcomer, she said, I have not bidden thee hither, but here mayest thou abide a while, if thou wilt. Nevertheless, take heed that here is no king's court. There is, forsooth, a folk that serveth me, or, it may be, more than one, of whom thou wert best to know naught. Of others I have but two servants, whom thou wilt see, 
and the one is a strange creature, who should scare thee or scathe thee with a good will, but of a good will shall serve nought save me. The other is a woman, a thrall, of little avail, save that, being compelled, she will work woman's service for me, but whom none else shall compel. Yea, but what is all this to thee, or to me that I should tell it to thee? I will not drive thee away, but if thine entertainment please thee not, make no plaint thereof to me, but depart at thy will. Now is this talk betwixt us over long, since, as thou seest, I and this king's son are in converse together. Art thou a king's son? Nay, lady, said Walter, I am but of the sons of merchants. It matters not, she said. Go thy ways into one of the chambers. And straightway she fell a-talking to the man who sat beside her, concerning the singing of the birds beneath her window in the morning, and of how she had bathed her that day in a pool of the woodlands, when she had been heated with hunting, and so forth, and all as if there had been none there save her and the king's son. But Walter departed all ashamed, as though he had been a poor man thrust away from a rich kinsman's door, and he said to himself that this woman was hateful, and naught love-worthy, and that she was little like to tempt him, despite all the fairness of her body. No one else he saw in the house that even. He found meat and drink duly served on a fair table, and thereafter he came on a goodly bed, and all things needful, but no child of Adam to do him service, or bid him welcome or warning. Nevertheless he ate and drank and slept, and put off thought of all these things till the morrow, all the more as he hoped to see the kind maiden some time betwixt sunrise and sunset on that new day. Chapter Twelve, The Wearing of Four Days in the Wood Beyond the World He arose betimes, but found no one to greet him, neither was there any sound of folk moving within the fair house, so he but broke his fast, and then went forth and wandered amongst the trees, till he found him a stream to bathe in, and after he had washed the night off him, he lay down under a tree thereby for a while, but soon turned back toward the house, lest perchance the maid should come thither, and he should miss her. It should be said that half a bow-shot from the house on that side, i.e. due north thereof, was a little hazel break, and round about it the trees were smaller of kind than the oaks and chestnuts he had passed through before, being mostly of birch and quicken-beam and young ash, with small wood betwixt them. So now he passed through the thicket, and coming to the edge thereof, beheld the lady and the king's son walking together hand in hand, full lovingly by seeming. He deemed it unmeet to draw back and hide him, so he went forth past them toward the house. The king's son scowled on him as he passed, but the lady, over whose beauteous face flickered the joyous morning smiles, took no more heed of him than if he had been one of the trees of the wood. But she had been so high and disdainful with him the evening before, that he thought little of that. The twain went on, skirting the hazel copse, and he could not choose but turn his eyes on them, so sorely did the lady's beauty draw them. Then befell another thing, for behind them the boughs of the hazels parted, and there stood that little evil thing, he or another of his kind, for he was quite unclad, save by his fell of yellowy-brown hair, and that he was girt with a leathern girdle, wherein was stuck an ugly two-edged knife. He stood upright a moment, and cast his eyes at Walter, and grinned, but not as if he knew him, and scarce could Walter say whether it were the one he had seen, or another. Then he cast himself down on his belly, and fell to creeping through the long grass like a serpent, following the footsteps of the lady and her lover. And now, as he crept, Walter deemed in his loathing that the creature was liker to a ferret than aught else. He crept on marvellous swiftly, and was soon clean out of sight. But Walter stood staring after him for a while, and then lay down by the copse side, that he might watch the house and the entry thereof, for he thought, Now perchance, presently, will the kind maiden come hither to comfort me with a word or two. But hour passed by hour, and still she came not, and still he lay there, and thought of the maid, and longed for her kindness and wisdom, till he could not refrain his tears, and wept for the lack of her. Then he arose, and went and sat in the porch, and was very downcast of mood. 
But as he sat there, back comes the lady again, the king's son leading her by the hand. They entered the porch, and she passed by him so close, that the odour of her raiment filled all the air about him, and the sleekness of her side nigh touched him, so that he could not fail to note that her garments were somewhat disarrayed, and that she kept her right hand, for her left the king's son held, to her bosom to hold the cloth together there, whereas the rich raiment had been torn off from her right shoulder. As they passed by him, the king's son once more scowled on him, wordless, but even more fiercely than before, and again the lady heeded him naught. After they had gone on a while, he entered the hall, and found it empty from end to end, and no sound in it save the tinkling of the fountain, but there was victual set on the board. He ate and drank thereof to keep life lusty within him, and then went out again to the woodside to watch, and to long, and the time hung heavy on his hands, because of the lack of the fair maiden. He was of mind not to go into the house to his rest that night, but to sleep under the boughs of the forest. But a little after sunset he saw a bright-clad image, moving amidst the carven images of the porch, and the king's son came forth, and went straight to him, and said, Thou art to enter the house, and go into thy chamber forthwith, and by no means to go forth of it betwixt sunset and sunrise. My lady will not away with thy prowling round the house in the night-tide. Therewith he turned away, and went into the house again, and Walter followed him soberly, remembering how the maid had bidden him forbear. So he went to his chamber, and slept. But amidst of the night he awoke, and deemed that he heard a voice not far off. So he crept out of his bed and peered around, lest perchance the maid had come to speak with him. But his chamber was dusk and empty. Then he went to the window and looked out, and saw the moon shining bright and white upon the greensward. And lo, the lady walking with the king's son, and he clad in thin and wanton raiment, but she in naught else, save what God had given her, of long, crispy yellow hair. Then was Walter ashamed to look on her, seeing that there was a man with her, and gat him back to his bed, but yet a long while ere he slept again, he had the image before his eyes of the fair woman on the dewy moonlit grass. The next day matters went much the same way, and the next also, save that his sorrow was increased, and he sickened sorely of hope deferred. On the fourth day also the forenoon wore as erst, but in the heat of the afternoon Walter sought to the hazel copse, and laid him down there hard by a little clearing thereof, and slept from very weariness of grief. There, after a while, he woke with words still hanging in his ears, and he knew at once that it was they twain talking together. The king's son had just done his say, and now it was the lady beginning in her honey-sweet voice, low but strong, wherein even was a little of huskiness. She said, Otto, belike it were well to have a little patience, till we find out what the man is, and whence he cometh. It will always be easy to rid us of him, it is but a word to our dwarf king, and it will be done in a few minutes. Patience, said the king's son angrily, I wot not how to have patience with him, for I can see of him that he is rude and violent and headstrong, and a low-born wily one. Forsooth he had patience enough with me the other even, when I rated him in like the dog he is, and he had no manhood to say one word to me. Soothly, as he followed after me, I had a mind to turn about and deal him a buffet on the face, to see if I could but draw one angry word from him. The lady laughed, and said, Well, Otto, I know not. That which thou deemest dastardly in him may be but prudence and wisdom, and he an alien far from his friends and nigh to his foes. Perchance we shall yet try him what he is. Meanwhile, I read thee, try him not with buffets, save he be weaponless and with bounden hands, else I deem that but a little while shalt thou be fain of thy blow. Now when Walter heard her words, and the voice wherein they were said, he might not forbear being stirred by them, and to him, all lonely there, they seemed friendly. But he lay still, and the king's son answered the lady, and said, I know not what is in thine heart concerning this runagate, that thou shouldst bemock me with his valiancy, whereof thou knowest naught. If thou deem me unworthy of thee, send me back safe to my father's country. 
I may look to have worship there, yea, and the love of fair women belike. Therewith it seemed as if he had put forth his hand to the lady to caress her, for she said, Nay, lay not thine hand on my shoulder, for to-day and now it is not the hand of love, but of pride, and folly, and would-be mastery. Nay, neither shalt thou rise up and leave me, until thy mood is softer and kinder to me. Then was there silence betwixt them a while, and thereafter the king's son spake in a wheedling voice, My goddess, I pray thee pardon me, but canst thou wonder that I fear thy wearying of me, and am therefore peevish and jealous? Thou so far above the queens of the world, and I a poor youth that without thee were nothing. She answered naught, and he went on again. Was it not so, O goddess, that this man of the sons of the merchants was little heedful of thee, and thy loveliness, and thy majesty? She laughed, and said, Maybe he deemed not that he had much to gain of us, seeing thee sitting by our side, and whereas we spake to him coldly, and sternly, and disdainfully. Withal the poor youth was dazzled and shamefaced before us, that we could see in the eyes and the mien of him. Now this she spoke so kindly and sweetly, that again was Walter all stirred thereat, and it came into his mind that it might be she knew he was an eye, and hearing her, and that she spake as much for him as for the king's son. But that one answered, Lady, didst thou not see somewhat else in his eyes, to wit, that they had but of late looked on some fair woman other than thee? As for me, I deem it not so unlike that on the way to thine hall he may have fallen in with thy maid. He spoke in a faltering voice, as if shrinking from some storm that might come. And forsooth the lady's voice was changed as she answered, though there was no outward heat in it, rather it was sharp and eager and cold at once. She said, Yea, that is not ill thought of, but we may not always keep our thrall in mind. If it be so as thou deemest, we shall come to know it most like when we next fall in with her. Or, if she hath been shy this time, then shall she pay the heavier for it, for we will question her by the fountain in the hall, as to what betid by the fountain of the rock. Spake the king's son, faltering yet more, Lady, were it not better to question the man himself? The maid is stout-hearted, and will not be speedily quelled into a true tale, whereas the man I deem of no account. No, no, said the lady sharply, it shall not be. Then was she silent a while, and then she said, How if the man should prove to be our master? Nay, our lady, said the king's son, thou art jesting with me, thou and thy might and thy wisdom, and all that thy wisdom may command, to be overmastered by a gangrel churl. But how if I will not have it command, king's son? said the lady. I tell thee I know thine heart, but thou knowest not mine. But be at peace, for since thou hast prayed for this woman, nay, not with thy words I wot, but with thy trembling hands, and thine anxious eyes and knitted brow, I say, since thou hast prayed for her so earnestly, she shall escape this time. But whether it will be to her gain in the long run, I misdoubt me. See thou to that, Otto, thou who hast held me in thine arms so oft, and now thou mayest depart if thou wilt. It seemed to Walter as if the king's son were dumbfounded at her words. He answered naught, and presently he rose from the ground and went his way slowly toward the house. The lady lay there a little while, and then went her ways also, but turned away from the house toward the wood at the other end thereof, whereby Walter had first come thither. As for Walter, he was confused in mind and shaken in spirit, and withal he seemed to see guile and cruel deeds under the talk of those two, and waxed wrathful thereat. Yet he said to himself that naught might he do, but was as one bound hand and foot, till he had seen the maid again. CHAPTER Thirteen. NOW IS THE HUNT UP Next morning was he up betimes, but he was cast down and heavy of heart, not looking for aught else to betide than had betid those last four days. 
but otherwise it fell out. For when he came down into the hall, there was the lady sitting on the high seat all alone, clad but in a coat of white linen, and she turned her head when she heard his footsteps, and looked on him, and greeted him, and said, Come hither, guest. So he went and stood before her, and she said, Though as yet thou hast had no welcome here, and no honour, it hath not entered into thine heart to flee from us. And to say sooth, that is well for thee, for flee away from our hand thou mightest not, nor mightest thou depart without our furtherance. But for this we can thee thank, that thou hast abided here our bidding, and eaten thine heart through the heavy wearing of four days, and made no plaint. Yet I cannot deem thee a dastard. Thou so well knit and shapely of body, so clear-eyed and bold of visage, Wherefore now I ask thee, art thou willing to do me service, thereby to earn thy guesting? Walter answered her, somewhat faltering at first, for he was astonished at the change which had come over her, for now she spoke to him in friendly wise, though indeed as a great lady would speak to a young man ready to serve her in all honour. Said he, Lady, I can thank thee humbly and heartily in that thou biddest me do thee service. For these days past I have loathed the emptiness of the hours, and naught better could I ask for than to serve so glorious a mistress in all honour. She frowned somewhat, and said, Thou shalt not call me mistress. There is but one who so calleth me, that is my thrall, and thou art none such. Thou shalt call me lady, and I shall be well pleased that thou be my squire, and for this present thou shalt serve me in the hunting. So get thy gear, take thy bow and arrows, and gird thee to thy sword, for in this fair land may one find beasts more perilous than be buck or hart. I go now to array me. We will depart while the day is yet young, for so make we the summer day the fairest. He made obeisance to her, and she arose and went to her chamber, and Walter dight himself, and then abode her in the porch, and in less than an hour she came out of the hall, and Walter's heart beat, when he saw that the maid followed her hard at heel, and scarce might he school his eyes not to gaze over eagerly at his dear friend. She was clad, even as she was before, and was changed in no wise, save that love troubled her face when she first beheld him, and she had much ado to master it, howbeit the mistress heeded not the trouble of her, or made no semblance of heeding it, till the maiden's face was all according to its wont. But this Walter found strange, that after all that disdain of the maid's thraldom which he had heard of the mistress, and after all the threats against her, now was the mistress become mild and debonair to her, as a good lady to her good maiden. When Walter bowed the knee to her, she turned unto the maid, and said, Look thou, my maid, at this fair new squire that I have gotten, will not he be valiant in the greenwood, and see whether he be well shapen or not? Doth he not touch thine heart, when thou thinkest of all the woe, and fear, and trouble, of the world beyond the wood, which he hath escaped, to dwell in this little land peaceably, and well beloved both by the mistress and the maid? And thou, my squire, look a little at this fair slim maiden, and say if she pleaseth thee not, didst thou deem that we had any thing so fair in this lonely place? Frank and kind was the smile on her radiant visage, nor did she seem to note any whit the trouble on Walter's face, nor how he strove to keep his eyes from the maid. As for her, she had so wholly mastered her countenance, that belike she used her face guilefully, for she stood as one humble but happy, with a smile on her face, blushing, and with her head hung down, as if shame-faced before a goodly young man, a stranger. But the lady looked upon her kindly, and said, Come hither, child, and fear not this frank and free young man, who belike feareth thee a little, and full certainly feareth me, and yet only after the manner of men. And therewith she took the maid by the hand, and drew her to her, and pressed her to her bosom, and kissed her cheeks and her lips, and undid the lacing of her gown and bared a shoulder of her, and swept away her skirt from her feet, and then turned to Walter and said, Lo, thou squire! Is not this a lovely thing to have grown up amongst our rough oak-bowls? What, art thou looking at the iron ring there? 
it is naught, save a token that she is mine, and that I may not be without her. Then she took the maid by the shoulders, and turned her about as in sport, and said, Go thou now, and bring hither the good grey ones, for needs must we bring home some venison to-day, whereas this stout warrior may not feed on naught save manchets and honey. So the maid went her way, taking care, as Walter deemed, to give no side-glance to him. But he stood there shamefaced, so confused with all this open-hearted kindness of the great lady, and with the fresh sight of the darling beauty of the maid, that he went nigh to thinking that all he had heard since he had come to the porch of the house that first time was but a dream of evil. But while he stood pondering these matters, and staring before him as one mazed, the lady laughed out in his face, and touched him on the arm, and said, Ah, our squire, is it so that now thou hast seen my maid, thou wouldst with a good will abide behind to talk with her? But call to mind thy word pledged to me e'en now, and moreover I tell thee this for thy behoof, now she is out of earshot, that I will above all things take thee away to-day, for there be other eyes, and they naught uncomely, that look at whiles on my fair ankled thrall, and who knows but the swords might be out if I take not the better heed, and give thee not every whit of thy will. As she spoke and moved forward, he turned a little, so that now the edge of that hazel coppice was within his eyeshot, and he deemed that once more he saw the yellow-brown evil thing crawling forth from the thicket. Then, turning suddenly on the lady, he met her eyes, and seemed in one moment of time to find a far other look in them than that of frankness and kindness, though in a flash they changed back again, and she said merrily and sweetly, So, so, sir squire, now art thou awake again, and mayest for a little while look on me. Now it came into his head, with that look of hers, all that might befall him and the maid, if he mastered not his passion, nor did what he might to dissemble. So he bent the knee to her, and spoke boldly to her in her own vein, and said, Nay, most gracious of ladies, never would I abide behind to-day, since thou farest afield. But if my speech be hampered, or mine eyes stray, is it not because my mind is confused by thy beauty, and the honey of kind words which floweth from thy mouth? She laughed outright at his word, but not disdainfully, and said, this is well spoken, squire, and even what a squire should say to his liege lady, when the sun is up on a fair morning, and she and he and all the world are glad. She stood quite near him as she spoke. Her hand was on his shoulder, and her eyes shone and sparkled. Sooth to say, that excusing of his confusion was like enough in seeming to the truth, for sure never creature was fashioned fairer than she clad she was for the greenwood, as the hunting goddess of the Gentiles, with her green gown gathered unto her girdle, and sandals on her feet, a bow in her hand, and a quiver at her back. She was taller, and bigger of fashion than the dear maiden, whiter of flesh, and more glorious, and brighter of hair, as a flower of flowers for fairness and fragrance. She said, Thou art verily a fair squire before the hunt is up, and if thou be as good in the hunting, all will be better than well, and the guest will be welcome. But lo, here cometh our maid with the good grey ones. Go meet her, and we will tarry no longer than for thy taking the leash in hand. So Walter looked, and saw the maid coming with two couple of great hounds in the leash, straining against her as she came along. He ran lightly to meet her, wondering if he should have a look or a half-whisper from her, but she let him take the white thongs from her hand, with the same half-smile of shamefacedness still set on her face, and, going past him, came softly up to the lady, swaying like a willow branch in the wind, and stood before her, with her arms hanging down by her sides. Then the lady turned to her and said, Look to thyself, our maid, while we are away. This fair young man thou needest not to fear, indeed, for he is good and leal, but what thou shalt do with the king's son I wot not. He is a hot lover, forsooth, but a hard man, 
and whiles evil is his mood, and perilous both to thee and me. And if thou do his will, it shall be ill for thee, and if thou do it not, take heed of him, and let me, and me only, come between his wrath and thee. I may do somewhat for thee. Even yesterday he was instant with me to have thee chastised after the manner of thralls, but I bade him keep silence of such words, and jeered him, and mocked him, till he went away from me peevish and in anger. So look to it that thou fall not into any trap of his contrivance. Then the maid cast herself at the mistress's feet, and kissed and embraced them, and as she rose up the lady laid her hand lightly on her head, and then, turning to Walter, cried out, Now, squire, let us leave all these troubles and wiles and desires behind us, and flit through the merry greenwood like the Gentiles of old days. And therewith she drew up the laps of her gown till the whiteness of her knees was seen, and set off swiftly toward the wood that lay south of the house, and Walter followed, marvelling at her goodliness. Nor durst he cast a look backward to the maiden, for he knew that she desired him, and it was her only that he looked to for his deliverance from this house of guile and lies. Chapter 14 The Hunting of the Heart As they went, they found a change in the land, which grew emptier of big and wide-spreading trees, and more beset with thickets. From one of these they roused a heart, and Walter let slip his hounds thereafter, and he and the lady followed running. Exceeding swift was she, and well breathed withal, so that Walter wondered at her, and eager she was in the chase as the very hounds, heeding nothing the scratching of briars, or the whipping of stiff twigs as she sped on. But for all their eager hunting, the quarry outran both dogs and folk, and gat him into a great thicket, amidmost whereof was a wide plash of water. Into the thicket they followed him, but he took to the water under their eyes, and made land on the other side, and because of the tangle of underwood he swam across much faster than they might have any hope to come round on him. And so were the hunters left undone for that time. So the lady cast herself down on the green grass and nigh the water, while Walter blew the hounds in and coupled them up. Then he turned round to her, and lo, she was weeping for despite that they had lost the quarry. And again did Walter wonder that so little a matter should raise a passion of tears in her. He durst not ask what ailed her, or proffer her solace, but was not ill appaid by beholding her loveliness as she lay. Presently she raised up her head, and turned to Walter, and spake to him angrily, and said, Squire, why dost thou stand staring at me like a fool? Yea, lady, he said, but the sight of thee maketh me foolish to do aught else but to look on thee. She said in a peevish voice, Tush, squire, the day is too far spent for soft and courtly speeches. What was good there is naught so good here. Withal I know more of thine heart than thou deemest. Walter hung down his head and reddened, and she looked on him, and her face changed, and she smiled and said, kindly this time, Look ye, squire, I am hot and weary and ill-content, but presently it will be better with me, for my knees have been telling my shoulders that the cold water of this little lake will be sweet and pleasant this summer noonday, and that I shall forget my foil when I have taken my pleasure therein. Wherefore, go thou with thine hounds without the thicket, and there abide my coming. And I bid thee look not aback as thou goest, for therein were peril to thee. I shall not keep thee tarrying long alone. He bowed his head to her, and turned and went his ways. And now, when he was a little space away from her, he deemed her indeed a marvel of women, and well-nigh forgot all his doubts and fears concerning her, whether she were a fair image fashioned out of lies and guile, or it might be but an evil thing in the shape of a goodly woman. Forsooth, when he saw her caressing the dear and friendly maid, his heart all turned against her, despite what his eyes and his ears told his mind, and she seemed like, as it were, a serpent, 
enfolding the simplicity of the body which he loved. But now it was all changed, and he lay on the grass and longed for her coming, which was delayed for somewhat more than an hour. Then she came back to him, smiling and fresh and cheerful, her green gown let down to her heels. He sprang up to meet her, and she came close to him, and spake from a laughing face, "'Squire, hast thou no meat in thy wallet? For, meseemeth, I fed thee when thou art hungry the other day. Do thou now the same by me?' He smiled, and louted to her, and took his wallet, and brought out thence bread and flesh and wine, and spread them all out before her on the green grass, and then stood by humbly before her. But she said, Nay, my squire, sit down by me and eat with me, for to-day are we both hunters together. So he sat down by her trembling, but neither for awe of her greatness, nor for fear and horror of her guile and sorcery. A while they sat there together after they had done their meat, and the lady fell a-talking with Walter, concerning the parts of the earth, and the manners of men, and of his journeyings to and fro. At last she said, Thou hast told me much, and answered all my questions wisely, and as my good squire should, and that pleaseth me. But now, tell me of the city wherein thou art born and bred, a city whereof thou hast hitherto told me naught. Lady, he said, it is a fair and a great city, and to many it seemeth lovely, but I have left it, and now it is nothing to me. Hast thou not kindred there? said she. Yea, said he, and foemen withal, and a false woman waylayeth my life there. And what was she? said the lady. Said Walter, she was but my wife. Was she fair? said the lady. Walter looked on her a while, and then said, I was going to say that she was well nigh as fair as thou, but that may scarce be, yet was she very fair. But now, kind and gracious lady, I will say this word to thee. I marvel that thou askest so many things concerning the city of Langton-on-Holm, where I was born, and where are my kindred yet, for me seemeth that thou knowest it thyself. I know it, I? said the lady. What then? Thou knowest it not? said Walter. Spake the lady, and some of her old disdain was in her words. Dost thou deem that I wander about the world and its cheaping steads like one of the chapmen? Nay, I dwell in the wood beyond the world and nowhere else. What hath put this word into thy mouth? He said, Pardon me, lady, if I have misdone, but thus it was, Mine own eyes beheld thee going down the quays of our city, and thence a shipboard, and the ship sailed out of the haven. And first of all went a strange dwarf, whom I have seen here, and then thy maid, and then went thy gracious and lovely body. The lady's face changed as he spoke, and she turned red, and then pale, and set her teeth. But she refrained her, and said, Squire, I see of thee that thou art no liar, nor light of wit. Therefore I suppose that thou hast verily seen some appearance of me. But never have I been in Langton, nor thought thereof, nor known that such a stead there was, until thou namedst it e'en now. Wherefore I deem that an enemy hath cast the shadow of me on the air of that land. Yea, my lady, said Walter, and what enemy mightest thou have to have done this? She was slow of answer, but spake at last from a quivering mouth of anger. Knowest thou not the saw, that a man's foes are they of his own house? If I find out for a truth who hath done this, the said enemy shall have an evil hour with me. Again she was silent, and she clenched her hands and strained her limbs in the heat of her anger, so that Walter was afraid of her and all his misgivings came back to his heart again, and he repented that he had told her so much. But in a little while all that trouble and wrath seemed to flow off her, and again was she of good cheer, and kind and sweet to him, and she said, But in sooth, however it may be, I thank thee, my squire and friend, for telling me hereof, 
and surely no wight do I lay on thee. And moreover, is it not this vision which hath brought thee hither? So it is, lady, said he. Then have we to thank it, said the lady, and thou art welcome to our land. And therewith she held out her hand to him, and he took it on his knees and kissed it. And then it was as if a red-hot iron had run through his heart, and he felt faint, and bowed down his head. But he held her hand yet, and kissed it many times, and the wrist, and the arm, and knew not where he was. But she drew a little away from him, and arose, and said, Now is the day wearing, and if we are to bear back any venison we must buckle to the work. So arise, squire, and take the hounds and come with me, for not far off is a little thicket, which mostly harbours foison of deer, great and small. Let us come our ways. Chapter 15 The Slaying of the Quarry So they walked on quietly thence some half a mile, and ever the lady would have Walter to walk by her side, and not follow a little behind her, as was meet for a servant to do, and she touched his hand at whiles, as she showed him beast and fowl and tree, and the sweetness of her body overcame him, so that for a while he thought of nothing save her. Now, when they were come to the thicket-side, she turned to him, and said, Squire, I am no ill woodman, so that thou mayest trust me that we shall not be brought to shame the second time, and I shall do sagely. So knock an arrow to thy bow, and abide me here, and stir not hence, for I shall enter this thicket without the hounds, and arouse the quarry for thee, and see that thou be brisk and clean shooting, and then shalt thou have reward of me. Therewith she drew up her skirts through her girdle again, took her bent bow in her hand, and drew an arrow out of the quiver, and stepped lightly into the thicket, leaving him longing for the sight of her, as he hearkened to the tread of her feet on the dry leaves, and the rustling of the brake as she thrust through it. Thus he stood for a few minutes, and then he heard a kind of gibbering cry without words, yet as of a woman, coming from the thicket, and while his heart was yet gathering the thought that something had gone amiss, he glided swiftly, but with little stir, into the brake. He had gone but a little way, ere he saw the lady standing there in a narrow clearing, her face as pale as death, her knees cleaving together, her body swaying and tottering, her hands hanging down, and the bow and arrow fallen to the ground, and ten yards before her, a great-headed yellow creature, crouching flat to the earth, and slowly drawing nigher. He stopped short. One arrow was already notched to the string, and another hung loose to the lesser fingers of his string hand. He raised his right hand, and drew and loosed in a twinkling. The shaft flew close to the lady's side, and straightway all the wood rung with a huge roar, as the yellow lion turned about to bite at the shaft, which had sunk deep into him behind the shoulder, as if a bolt out of the heavens had smitten him. But straightway had Walter loosed again, and then, throwing down his bow, he ran forward, with his drawn sword gleaming in his hand, while the lion weltered and rolled, but had no might to move forward. Then Walter went up to him warily, and thrust him through to the heart and leapt aback, lest the beast might yet have life in him to smite. But he left his struggling, his huge voice died out, and he lay there, moveless, before the hunter. Walter abode a little, facing him, and then turned about to the lady, and she had fallen down in a heap whereas she stood, and lay there all huddled up and voiceless. So he knelt down by her, and lifted up her head, and bade her arise, for the foe was slain. And after a little she stretched out her limbs, and turned about on the grass, and seemed to sleep, and the colour came into her face again, and it grew soft and a little smiling. Thus she lay a while, and Walter sat by her, watching her, till at last she opened her eyes, and sat up, and knew him, and smiling on him, said, 
what hath befallen, squire, that I have slept and dreamed? He answered nothing, till her memory came back to her, and then she arose, trembling and pale, and said, Let us leave this wood, for the enemy is therein. And she hastened away before him, till they came out at the thicket side, whereas the hounds had been left, and they were standing there uneasy and whining. So Walter coupled them, while the lady stayed not, but went away swiftly homeward, and Walter followed. At last she stayed her swift feet, and turned round on Walter, and said, Squire, come hither. So did he, and she said, I am weary again, let us sit under this quicken tree and rest us. So they sat down, and she sat looking between her knees a while. And at last she said, Why didst thou not bring the lion's hide? He said, Lady, I will go back and flay the beast, and bring on the hide. And he arose therewith, but she caught him by the skirts, and drew him down, and said, Nay, thou shalt not go, abide with me, sit down again. He did so, and she said, Thou shalt not go from me, for I am afraid. I am not used to looking on the face of death. She grew pale as she spoke, and set a hand to her breast, and sat so a while without speaking. At last she turned to him smiling, and said, How was it with the aspect of me when I stood before the peril of the enemy? And she laid a hand upon his. O gracious one, quoth he, Thou wert, as ever, full lovely, but I feared for thee. She moved not her hand from his, and she said, Good and true squire, I said ere I entered the thicket, e'en now, that I would reward thee if thou slewest the quarry. He is dead, though thou hast left the skin behind upon the carcass. Ask now thy reward, but take time to think what it shall be. He felt her hand warm upon his, and drew in the sweet odour of her, mingled with the woodland scents, under the hot sun of the afternoon, and his heart was clouded with manlike desire of her. And it was a near thing, but he had spoken, and craved of her, the reward of the freedom of her maid, and that he might depart with her into other lands. But, as his mind wavered betwixt this and that, the lady, who had been eyeing him keenly, drew her hand away from him, and therewith doubt and fear flowed into his mind, and he refrained him of speech. Then she laughed merrily, and said, The good squire is shamefaced, he feareth a lady more than a lion. Will it be a reward to thee if I bid thee to kiss my cheek? Therewith she leaned her face toward him, and he kissed her well favouredly, and then sat gazing on her, wondering what should betide to him on the morrow. Then she arose and said, Come, squire, and let us home. Be not abashed, there shall be other rewards hereafter. So they went their ways quietly, and it was nigh sunset against they entered the house again. Walter looked round for the maid, but beheld her not, and the lady said to him, I go to my chamber, and now is thy service over for this day. Then she nodded to him friendly, and went her ways. Chapter 16 Of the King's Son and the Maid But as for Walter, he went out of the house again, and fared slowly over the wood lawns, till he came to another close thicket or break. He entered from mere wantonness, or that he might be the more apart and hidden, so as to think over his case. There he lay down under the thick boughs, but could not so herd his thoughts, that they would dwell steady in looking into what might come to him within the next days. Rather visions of those two women, and the monster, did but float before him, and fear and desire and the hope of life ran to and fro in his mind. As he lay thus, he heard footsteps drawing near, and he looked between the boughs, and though the sun had just set, 
he could see close by him a man and a woman going slowly, and they hand in hand. At first he deemed it would be the king's son and the lady, but presently he saw that it was the king's son indeed, but that it was the maid whom he was holding by the hand. And now he saw of him that his eyes were bright with desire, and of her that she was very pale. Yet when he heard her begin to speak, it was in a steady voice that she said, King's son, thou hast threatened me oft and unkindly, and now thou threatenest me again, and no less unkindly. But whatever were thy need herein before, now is there no more need, for my mistress, of whom thou wert weary, is now grown weary of thee, and belike will not now reward me for drawing thy love to me, as once she would have done, to wit before the coming of this stranger. Therefore I say, since I am but a thrall, poor and helpless, betwixt you two mighty ones, I have no choice but to do thy will. As she spoke, she looked all round about her, as one distraught by the anguish of fear. Walter, amidst of his wrath and grief, had well nigh drawn his sword and rushed out of his lair upon the king's son. But he deemed it sure that, so doing, he should undo the maid altogether, and himself also belike, so he refrained him, though it were a hard matter. The maid had stayed her feet now close to where Walter lay, some five yards from him only, and he doubted whether she saw him not from where she stood. As to the king's son, he was so intent upon the maid, and so greedy of her beauty, that it was not like that he saw anything. Now, moreover, Walter looked, and deemed that he beheld something through the grass and bracken on the other side of those two, an ugly brown and yellow body, which, if it were not some beast of the Fumart kind, must needs be the monstrous dwarf or one of his kin, and the flesh crept upon Walter's bones with the horror of him. But the king's son spoke unto the maid, Sweetling, I shall take the gift thou givest me, neither shall I threaten thee any more, howbeit thou givest it not very gladly or graciously. She smiled on him with her lips alone, for her eyes were wandering and haggard. My lord, she said, is not this the manner of women? Well, he said, I say that I will take thy love even so given. Yet let me hear again that thou lovest not that vile newcomer, and that thou hast not seen him, save this morning along with my lady. Nay thou, thou shalt swear it. What shall I swear by? she said. Quoth he, Thou shalt swear by my body. And therewith he thrust himself close up against her. But she drew her hand from his, and laid it on his breast, and said, I swear it by thy body. He smiled on her licorously, and took her by the shoulders and kissed her face many times, and then stood aloof from her, and said, Now have I had Hansel, but tell me, when shall I come to thee? She spoke out clearly. Within three days at furthest, I will do thee to wit of the day and the hour to-morrow, or the day after. He kissed her once more, and said, Forget it not, or the threat holds good. And therewith he turned about, and went his ways toward the house and Walter saw the yellow-brown thing creeping after him in the gathering dusk. As for the maid, she stood for a while without moving, and looking after the king's son and the creature that followed him. Then she turned about to where Walter lay, and lightly put aside the boughs, and Walter leapt up, and they stood face to face. She said softly but eagerly, Friend, touch me not yet, he spake not, but looked on her sternly. She said, Thou art angry with me? Still he spake not, but she said, Friend, this at least I will pray thee, not to play with life and death, with happiness and misery. Dost thou not remember the oath which we swore each to each but a little while ago, 
and dost thou deem that I have changed in these few days? Is thy mind concerning thee and me the same as it was? If it be not so, now tell me. For now have I the mind to do, as if neither thou nor I are changed to each other. Whoever may have kissed mine unwilling lips, or whomsoever thy lips may have kissed. But if thou hast changed, and wilt no longer give me thy love, nor crave mine, then shall this steal, and she drew a sharp knife from her girdle, be for the fool and the dastard who hath made thee wroth with me, my friend, and my friend that I deemed I had won, and then let come what will come. But if thou be naught changed, and the oath yet holds, then, when a little while hath passed, may we thrust all evil and guile and grief behind us, and long joy shall lie before us, and long life, and all honour in death, if only thou wilt do as I bid thee, O oh my dear, and my friend, and my first friend. He looked on her, and his breast heaved up, as all the sweetness of her kind love took hold on him, and his face changed, and the tears filled his eyes, and ran over, and rained down before her, and he stretched out his hand toward her. Then she said, exceedingly sweetly, Now indeed I see that it is well with me, yea, and with thee also. A sore pain it is to me, that not even now may I take thine hand, and cast mine arms about thee, and kiss the lips that love me. But so it has to be. My dear, even so I were fain to stand here long before thee, even if we spake no more words to each other. But abiding here is perilous, for there is ever an evil spy upon my doings, who has now, as I deem, followed the king's son to the house, but who will return when he has tracked him home thither, so we must sunder. But belike there is yet time for a word or two. First, the reed which I had thought on for our deliverance is now afoot, though I durst not tell thee thereof, nor have time thereto. But this much shall I tell thee, that whereas great is the craft of my mistress in wizardry, yet I also have some little craft therein, and this, which she hath not, to change the aspect of folk so utterly that they seem other than they verily are. Yea, so that one may have the aspect of another. Now the next thing is this, whatsoever my mistress may bid thee, do her will therein, with no more naysaying than thou deemest may please her. And the next thing, wheresoever thou mayest meet me, speak not to me, make no sign to me, even when I seem to be all alone, till I stoop down and touch the ring on my ankle with my right hand. But if I do so, then stay thee, without fail, till I speak. The last thing I will say to thee, dear friend, ere we both go our ways, this it is. When we are free, and thou knowest all that I have done, I pray thee, deem me not evil and wicked, and be not wroth with me for my deed, whereas thou wottest well that I am not in like plight with other women. I have heard tell that when the knight goeth to the war, and hath overcome his foes by the shearing of swords and guileful tricks, and hath come back home to his own folk, they praise him and bless him and crown him with flowers, and boast of him before God in the minster, for his deliverance of friend and folk and city. Why shouldst thou be worse to me than this? Now all is said, my dear and my friend. Farewell, farewell. Therewith she turned, and went her ways toward the house, in all speed, but making somewhat of a compass. And when she was gone, Walter knelt down, and kissed the place where her feet had been, and arose thereafter, and made his way toward the house, he also, but slowly, and staying oft on his way. CHAPTER Seventeen OF THE HOUSE AND THE PLEASANTS IN THE WOOD On the morrow morning Walter loitered a while about the house, till the morn was grown old, and then about noon he took his bow and arrows, and went into the woods to the northward, to get him some venison. 
he went somewhat far ere he shot him a fawn, and then he sat him down to rest under the shade of a great chestnut tree, for it was not far past the hottest of the day. He looked around thence, and saw below him a little dale with a pleasant stream running through it, and he bethought him of bathing therein, so he went down and had his pleasure of the water and the willowy banks, for he lay naked a while on the grass by the lip of the water, for joy of the flickering shade and the little breeze that ran over the down-long ripples of the stream. Then he did honour his raiment, and began to come his ways up the bent, but had scarce gone three steps ere he saw a woman coming towards him from downstream. His heart came into his mouth when he saw her, for she stooped and reached down her arm, as if she would lay her hand on her ankle, so that at first he deemed it had been the maid, but at the second eye-shot he saw that it was the mistress. She stood still and looked on him, so that he deemed she would have him come to her. She stood still and looked on him, so that he deemed she would have him come to her. So he went to meet her, and grew somewhat shamefaced as he drew nigher, and wondered at her, for now was she clad but in one garment of some dark grey, silky stuff, embroidered with, as it were, a garland of flowers about the middle, but which was so thin that, as the wind drifted it from side and limb, it hid her no more, but for the said garland, than if water were running over her. Her face was full of smiling joy and content, as she spake to him, in a kind, caressing voice, and said, I give thee good day, good squire, and well art thou met. And she held out her hand to him. He knelt down before her, and kissed it, and abode still upon his knees, and hanging down his head. But she laughed outright, and stooped down to him, and put her hand to his arms, and raised him up, and said to him, What is this, my squire, that thou kneelest to me as to an idol? He said, faltering, I wot not, but perchance thou art an idol, and I fear thee. What? she said, more than yesterday, whenas thou sawest me afraid? Said he, Yea, for that now I see thee unhidden, and meseemeth there hath been none such since the old days of the Gentiles. She said, Hast thou not yet bethought thee of a gift to crave of me, a reward for the slaying of mine enemy, and the saving of me from death? O oh, my lady, he said, even so much would I have done for any other lady, or forsooth for any poor man, for so my manhood would have bidden me. Speak not of gifts to me, then. Moreover, and he reddened therewith, and his voice faltered, Didst thou not give me my sweet reward yesterday? What more durst I ask? She held her peace a while, and looked on him keenly, and he reddened under her gaze. Then wrath came into her face, and she reddened, and knit her brows, and spake to him in a voice of anger, and said, Nay, what is this? It is growing in my mind that thou deemest the gift of me unworthy. Thou! an alien, an outcast, one endowed with the little wisdom of the world without the wood. And here I stand before thee, all glorious in my nakedness, and so fulfilled of wisdom, that I can make this wilderness, to any whom I love, more full of joy than the kingdoms and cities of the world. And thou, ah! But it is the enemy that hath done this, and made the guileless guileful. Yet will I have the upper hand at least, though thou suffer for it, and I suffer for thee. Walter stood before her with hanging head, and he put forth his hands, as if praying off her anger, and pondered what answer he should make, for now he feared for himself and the maid. So at last he looked up to her, and said boldly, Nay, lady, I know what thy words mean, whereas I remember thy first welcome of me. I wot, forsooth, that thou wouldst call me base-born, and of no account, and unworthy to touch the hem of thy raiment, and that I have been overbold and guilty towards thee. And doubtless this is sooth, and I have deserved thine anger, but I will not ask thee to pardon me, for I have done but what I must needs. 
she looked on him calmly now, and without any wrath, but rather as if she would read what was written in his inmost heart. Then her face changed into joyousness again, and she smote her palms together, and cried out, This is but foolish talk, for yesterday did I see thy valiancy, and to-day I have seen thy goodliness, and I say, that though thou mightest not be good enough for a fool woman of the earthly baronage, yet art thou good enough for me, the wise and the mighty and the lovely. And whereas thou sayest that I gave thee but disdain when first thou camest to us, grudge not against me, therefore, because it was done but to prove thee, and now thou art proven. Then again he knelt down before her, and embraced her knees, and again she raised him up, and let her arm hang down over his shoulder, and her cheek brush his cheek, and she kissed his mouth, and said, Hereby is all forgiven, both thine offence and mine, and now cometh joy and merry days. Therewith her smiling face grew grave, and she stood before him, looking stately and gracious and kind at once, and she took his hand and said, Thou might esteem my chamber in the golden house of the wood over queenly, since thou art no masterful man. So now hast thou chosen well the place wherein to meet me to-day, for hard by on the other side of the stream is a bower of pleasance, which, forsooth, not every one who cometh to this land may find. There shall I be to thee as one of the up-country damsels of thine own land, and thou shalt not be abashed. She sidled up to him as she spoke, and would he, would he not, her sweet voice tickled his very soul with pleasure, and she looked aside on him, happy and well content. So they crossed the stream, by the shallow, below the pool wherein Walter had bathed, and within a little they came upon a tall fence of flake hurdles, and a simple gate therein. The lady opened the same and they entered thereby into a close, all planted as a most fair garden, with hedges of rose and woodbine, and with linden trees a-blossom, and long ways of green grass, betwixt borders of lilies and clove gilly-flowers, and other sweet garland flowers. And a branch of the stream, which they had crossed erewhile, wandered through that garden, and in the midst was a little house built of post and pan, and thatched with yellow straw, as if it were new done, then Walter looked this way and that, and wondered at first, and tried to think in his mind what should come next, and how matters would go with him, but his thought would not dwell steady on any other matter than the beauty of the lady amidst the beauty of the garden. And withal, she was now grown so sweet and kind, and even somewhat timid and shy with him, that scarce did he know whose hand he held or whose fragrant bosom and sleek side went so close to him. So they wandered here and there through the waning of the day, and when they entered at last into the cool dusk house, then they loved and played together, as if they were a pair of lovers guileless, with no fear for the morrow, and no seeds of enmity and death sown betwixt them. 